Hello and welcome to everybody. This is the seventh episode of the three book series. And I'm very excited for today because my guest is Adam Roberts. So to introduce you, I can say a lot of things, but uh, I think the most obvious is to say that you are the founding editor of The Side View, mm -hmm. which is a general philosophical, artistic, uh, cultural platform or environment, media environment. And it has published three issues of The Side View Journal, and it also has a podcast. Um, Adam is also quite active on Twitter. I mean, quite active. Uh, but active. So I'll leave a link to the, your Twitter account as well. So anything else in way of introduction before we get uh, to no, the three that, books? No, that pretty much sums it up. I'll say, think, uh, I'll say this, uh, that you are a philosopher and your aim, as I have so far detected, is that uh, both in the platform, the environment that you are creating and in your writing as well, that your aim seems to be uh, to introduce and to promote the idea of philosophy as including both practice and theory, mm -hmm. practical philosophy, philosophy as a way of life. Mm -hmm. And we will get to that, I'm sure, in the in discussion of the three books. All right, so you were kind enough to select three books for our discussion today. Let's uh, hear the list first. Yeah, so I picked um, Alvin Noe's book, The Varieties of Presence. Uh, Pierre Hadot, uh, What is Ancient Philosophy, and Martin Laird, uh, Into the Silent Land. Mm. Uh, I think that you gave me, it's, it's an in interesting uh, mix up because that's a, he has two books. One of them is Into the Silent Land. The other one is A Sunlit Absence. Mm -hmm. And I found the uh, Sunlit Absence. Because I think that that was the original title that he gave me, but it's okay. Oh, was it? There's oh, yeah. Well, so okay, so that sequence of books, I'll say the Martin Laird, he wrote a sequence of three books: mm. Into the Silent Land, Sunlit Absence, and Ocean of Light. And they're they're really they're very related. Mm. So, which one should we begin with? Um. I don't know. Well, I, I kind of had in mind, they, they kind of represent sort of like three different kind of modes that I have in my thinking. But in some sense, I'm attracted to all three of them for the same reason, which is mm. that they, well, they're, they have, um, they have, pr they're very practice oriented um, texts, all three of them. Um, but I, I like these three because they kind of, well, they kind of uh, go into sort of the three different modes that I also think of as kind of um, the, the three main channels that go into the side view as well. And so they're, they're, they're personal books that, you know, I, I take mm -hmm. a lot out of, but they've also kind of informed my larger perspective. And so I kind of think of them, you know, Noe's book is kind of, um, it's it's a philosophical text, but it's also um, it's centered kind of in a, a, a phenomenological view and approach. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about Noe's work, you know that he's also in dialogue with a lot of cognitive scientists and um, has a very kind of em empirical flavor to it in the sense of um, this is a guy who's also keeping track of uh, what's happening sort of physiologically from a third person scientific standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I find that that dialogue between phenomenology and cognitive science very interesting. Mm -hmm. And then Hado, of course, has the um, traditional sort of philosophical view, you know, dating back to uh, ancient Greece, um, but also very much in that practical vein, philosophy as spiritual exercise, philosophy as way of life, uh, philosophy as transformative practice. Um, and then um, the third one, Martin Laird, kind of takes us into the realm of contemplation, spirituality, religion. Um, so there's, there's three really different kind of languages, vocabularies, and sets of concerns, um, but they all kind of turn on the same idea of 
practice as transformative, uh, paying attention to paying attention to perception, paying attention to awareness. Mm-hmm. Um, just in these, the kind of just different disciplinary approaches, mm-hmm. um, and of course they probably have different sort of uh, philosophical commitments. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Laird's tradition is in in Christian contemplation. Um, mm-hmm. Hado's, you know, he's talking about Plato and Aristotle and Stoicism, uh, Neoplatonism, mm-hmm. and then uh, Noe, like I said, kind of has a more probably has the mo- most. Uh, sort of empirical and secular approach out of all three. Um, so it's kind of like a big spectrum. And that's kind of the spectrum that I find myself running up and down most days when I'm, when I'm thinking about these issues. Mm, interesting. So it's like there are three different paths of discovering the same core insight. I think so, yeah. The, the presence of practice. Uh, for, for me, Noah's uh, Varieties of Presence was a very significant book. Uh, it was one of those books that awakens you from the, the dogmatic slumber. <laughs> that was like, yeah. It had that effect. It doesn't really begin by promoting a way of activity, a way, a way of being active, but it actually it reveals already mm-hmm. existing ac- activities, even in situations where it seems like we are passive. We are just observing an apple or we are just right. looking at a painting. It, it, it shows, argues how that is a, a an outcome of a history of learning, history mm-hmm. of uh, having learned a, a kind of active participation in something. So after I read books like that, that was, I think, one of the major books that I couldn't really do um, experimental psychology the same way bef- uh, anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because uh, mm-hmm. it, it is still very uh, common in experimental psychology to sit people in front of a, to have a research participant sit in front of a screen and have them see these uh, flashes or snapshots of pictures or a scene mm-hmm. and treating participants as if they are just passively receiving this uh, information, receiving yeah. a visual scene. Uh, and Noe was one of the people who, who helped me realize that that's, that is a contrived situation and that, that has to do with the experimenter, psychologists actually constructing, actively constructing a scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, artificial scenario that mm-hmm. and also the insight that uh, we don't see pictures we don't just see pictures i think that is also in that book that we see with pictures mm-hmm. picture yeah. is something that we see with yeah uh, yeah well i think that uh, i mean the the practice that is present in that book is a, the kind of phenomenological practice that he keeps pointing back to and it, so in that sense, the the book isn't the book is making arguments, right? Like it's full, of, like it's kind of a, a sequence of propositional statements about facts about the, that things that Noe takes to be the case about perception, right? Mm-hmm. But um, the the answers to whether or not those statements are true are things that you can kind of go and investigate for yourself simply by paying attention to your own experience. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what I think I find really appealing about Noe's book and about that kind of phenomenological mode mm-hmm. in general, which is where I think it kind it kind of shades into um, something like uh, a contemplative practice. That's not the kind of language that Noe typically uses, but um, it has that same quality of paying attention to attention, of paying attention to perception as you're perceiving there's there's a kind of a a call to give an account of how your perception is being formed moment to moment and to see if you can't say something uh meaningfully intelligent about the nature of your own perception or about the nature of perception in general Mm -hmm. um and so that's that's what i think is is really appealing about texts like that Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, uh, I'm very interested in uh, your approach to that book uh, because given our different projects and uh, different backgrounds, we really we read the book in somewhat different ways. Yeah. Now, moving a little bit to uh, Pierre Hadot's book, uh, I read the, the chapter that I read carefully was the chapter about the image of Socrates mm. in which he talks about uh, Socrates the mode in which 
uh, he is promoting the, the his his philosophy isn't about knowing things it's about a, a certain way of being mm -hmm. uh, and immediately i think more carefully thinking about this topic uh, makes it clear but i think we should spend some time on on this question of why is this not a kind of narcissistic attention to self why mm -hmm. isn't socrates's project about uh, a kind of self-help it's like become right. like, become like socrates yeah well uh, there there's quite a lot in uh, plato's dialogues about this where you know that's a lot of our a, a lot of our image of socrates um you know hado talks about some other sources that we have but a lot of the a lot of the image that we have of socrates comes from plato's dialogues um we know quite a bit about um, you know, Plato's relationship to Socrates. And, you know, there's some conversation about where, where is the fictional Socrates in these dialogues and who is the real historical Socrates. But, you know, he's something like, he's something like the figure that we see in those dialogues. And in those dialogues, um, the, the injunctions, like in, in Phaedo, for example, um, the, the big message is that philosophy is learning how to die. And that takes, um, that can take many different shapes. And, you know, in that dialogue, Socrates is literally on his way to death. Like he, he's, he's being sentenced to death. So in that sense, it's a very literal sense of um, philosophy has been a preparation for death and how to let go. Um, but there's also all kinds of other ways that that statement can be cashed out just in terms of, um, you know, the language that we would use today, you know, in, in, in the sense of like an ego death or the sense of an ongoing death of the self. Um, and so um, really those injunctions to pay attention to yourself um, are, are done in service of, of overcoming yourself or losing yourself in the sense of your individual biographical identity with all its kind of peculiarities and idiosyncrasies and attachments and aversions and things like that. That is what the philosophical practice is mostly about. And so Hado talks a lot about um, what's called melite thanato. Melite thanato. These are uh, meditations on death or death practices. And a lot of these are um, sort of deaths of the small self. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're, the, the injunction isn't this kind of um, narcissistic self-improvement project of um, trying to enhance who you are as a self, but in fact, to, to kind of learn different ways of letting go of that kind of um, clinging, cloying attachment to your identity so that you can gain a different kind of comportment with things. Mm -hmm. so, so that you can, you can gain a different vision of, of, uh, uh, of what, you know, the mystery of life and death is and, and things like right, that. Right, right, right. It is by letting go of this image, self-image, it's the self, uh, the minor projects that are attached to our, our self. Then we can, it is by doing that that we can we free ourselves to care for uh, deeper values. That's uh, right. For just and unjust action or good yeah. and bad mm -hmm. uh, values. And then it, the, the self becomes irrelevant in, in that light. Yeah, well, it, it, uh, it, it I, for me, I think the, the sense is, is that it recontextualizes mm. value. It recontextualizes sort of what's important mm -hmm. um, in in your life and in other people's lives. And so, yeah, there is that there is that um, relationship there between knowing and knowledge and care and caring. Mm -hmm. And those those are really um, those are really the two two of the 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 most uh, potent strands that we get out of. Out of the out of Socrates's messages in those dialogues is you know we hear a lot about know thyself but there's also a a just as strong injunction to care for thyself um, and that that knowing caring is kind of wrapped up in these practices. <laughs>
Yeah, I went through uh, recently the Nicomachean Ethics, and uh, in that, Aristotle also says that deliberate uh, deliberation is not just something that gives us knowledge of of things. Mm. Deliberation commands or, or issues commands. It mm-hmm. it it compels action. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. not just okay. This fact is revealed to me now, but mm-hmm. that I should do this now. I should engage in this way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so there's that. There's definitely that. Um, there's there's knowing and caring, connecting, connected, but also um, the the moral vector is mm-hmm. always there. You know, your your practice is anchored towards some vision of the good. Mm-hmm. You know, and in a lot of ways, the the practice and the vision of the good kind of have this reciprocal relationship, where you're in a process of of sort of revealing the good's nature through practice. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of relative to uh, your own effort in that way. Right. There was one thing I wanted to ask you uh, mm-hmm. that is also mentioned in this uh, the image of Socrates chapter, and that is the the strangeness of philosophy and philosopher. Mm. That uh, the people who teach about Socrates now at the universities are not necessarily Socratic. Uh, so we have to transpose the context of Socrates in relation to Socrates to now our context and the philosophers now. And yeah. a statement made in this chapter is that being a philosopher is uh, like being a stranger, being yeah. somebody who doesn't really fit. And I think that the word was uh, atopos at or yeah. atopos, uh, which atopos. is like not having a place, uh, being yeah. irreplaceable. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what you think about that. And I, because you also conduct yourself as a philosopher, I was wondering if you also have that experience of being a stranger. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because I think that sense of being placeless um, is, is part of what gives, gives somebody like Socrates the perspective that he has where he's not, um, you know, he's, he gets, he ultimately is sent to his death for, for challenging the gods of the state, right. And essentially challenging, um, the state itself in a way. And it's, it's his strangeness. It's his, He's a little bit askance. He's a little bit askew of of the situation. He's um, he's 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 broken free of the inertia of just simply um, sort of accepting what the narratives that are being cast around him are, and instead he's 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 kind of his own center, right? Mm. That's that's kind of um, his strength and. Um, you know, again, just thinking about Phaedo, that's, that's why he kind of, he's able to, to go sort of happily to his death because he's, he's, he's honoring um, a set of higher values that supersede those of the state that he's challenging. And that's his connection. And that's his, he, he's grounded in that, in that belief that, or in that, you know, sense of knowing that um, there is, there is a different, there's a different value structure that we should be oriented towards that goes beyond um, the immediate customs and uh, and community that you might be embedded in. Mm -hmm. And so his strangeness gives him that um, perspective, but it, it also, I think gives him a little bit of that characteristic sort of lucidity that he has. It gives him a little bit of freedom and autonomy. So, um, the, the one side is that he, he has this strangeness. He is a topos. He is without place. But on the other hand, what is he doing? He's, he hangs out in town talking with, you know, town folk all day long. And he's, you know, he's likable. Everybody, everybody likes him. So he's not, um, you know, the other figure that comes to mind is, uh, like uh, Diogenes, the cynic, who's, uh, you know, he also has a strangeness. He's also a philosopher. He's also a topos, but he's, he's, um, you know, he's trying to get a rise out of people all of the time. He's like trying to disturb the peace. Like, um, you know, he has that punk rock 
quality to him. Whereas Socrates kind of has a, a different flavor to him where he's still, yeah, he seems very, he seems very personable, even though he's constantly challenging people, um, constantly getting them to kind of go beyond their own assumptions about, about the given and about, um, you know, the, the way knowledge is structured and, you know, asking them constantly inquiring into, uh, well, well, why do you think that? Why, why do you have that belief? Like how many of these beliefs do you just kind of have as a like function of passive inheritance? Like how many of these things have you actually kind of cracked open and looked at? So it's the strangeness, but it's also, there's a kind of a, a friendliness to him, you know? Mm-hmm. And so we, we, we see that, um, like one of the, one of the preconditions for like a proper dialectic is friendship. Like you actually have to be in a, in something like a friend relationship to have the kind of trust needed to, to, to engage in some of these inquiries. So he has that strangeness um, and that autonomy in that sense. Uh, But then there's this other side where, um, yeah, he seems pretty connected to, to the people in his community. Right. Right. Yeah, I I would agree. He's a at least when I read the dialogues, I see him as a very lovable character, mm-hmm. and uh, he's very patient. It's not. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine that uh, somebody else having the same level of wisdom and insight. I mean, not maybe not wisdom, but the same understanding, and being so patient uh, with. The, the conversation partners mm-hmm. and he's very forgiving as well of uh, the errors not only of the errors of the people in front of him but sometimes the person tells him about somebody who makes a mistake like hypothetically yeah and socrates invites the the other person to say no we should be forgiving of this uh of of such a person because they yeah they don't know mm-hmm. they don't know enough to make the right decision um Actually, I would also contrast him with Plato himself, who went away from the marketplace and built an academy. <laughs> so right. already with Plato, we have the disengagement from the public. Yeah, it's a little bit different. But even there, um, there's, there's that relationship between, there, there is something important about the distance. You know, there is something, and that's, Socrates has that distance. Mm. You know, he seems to have that distance from himself. And he also seems to have that distance from, you know, his fellow Greeks. And that, that's what gives him a different view. But then he's coming back in to conversation with people. And the Academy, um, I talk about this a lot, but uh, Peter Sloterdijk makes the, the point that the Academy, so the, the word that philosophers use for kind of achieving that distance is epoche, right? Which is a, a term we get from the skeptics, from, from Pyrrho and so on. Um, an epoche is this kind of move that you can make in your own consciousness and your own experiences where you, where you suspend judgment, not just, not just judgment in a kind of, uh, uh, surface level sense of, uh, issuing a judgment about whether you like somebody or not, say, or, uh, a judgment about, uh, whether or not to award a, a point in a, in, a, in a sporting game or something like that, but judgment in like a really deep sense of like, what, what is happening around you? You know, can, can you suspend identification with your own kind of automatic meaning making structures mm-hmm. that are like constantly shooting out explanations about what's happening in the world, like in a very basic sense, like there's like an epoch is like a su- suspension of that activity. And this is the kind of thing that um, you need to be able to do to kind of have the kind of dialectic that you see in the dialogues. And that, you, you know, I think of it as a kind of like a first move in philosophy mm-hmm. in, order, in order to inquire into the nature of experience, the nature of perception and knowledge and so on. You need to be able to kind of stop and suspend. And um, the point that Sloterdijk makes is that this is something that we do as, as philosophers. And this is something that all people will do at different points in their life, whether or not they're explicitly aware of doing it or have a good language for describing what's happening. Um, we all do these things, you know, you kind of have these moments of like, whoa, what's, what's really happening right now? Um, but you can also create conditions 
that sort of facilitate that process. So Plato's Academy, Sloterdijk makes the point, is, is, a, is a kind of architectural epoche. It's a, it's a space that allows you to suspend judgments, to see what happens, to create a space, an opening for new things to emerge. And so Sloterdijk talks about like, this is a, this is a space where ideas can come to us. Mm. You know? um, and so that's, that's essentially um, Plato's Academy works like that. Monasteries work like that. You know, various retreat centers work like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think of like going into a library as something like that. Sure. Right? So sure. like if you want to use that kind of psychological language, these are like affordance spaces. Mm -hmm. But what do they afford? Like a gym affords uh, exercise. You know, uh, a soccer field affords soccer games. Um, but a, uh, Plato's Academy affords uh, epoche. It affords contemplative practice. Mm -hmm. um, that and that's you know that's what the monks are doing uh, in their monasteries. Like they're mm -hmm. they're creating spaces where this is more likely. And um, yeah, so the academy, Plato's academy, is not. It's set outside of. I don't think it's like too far outside of the city. I don't think it's like this thing where you have to take like a like a make a huge pr pilgrimage to get to it. But it's like it's just out outside, far enough, and it's kind of like it's a space set off just for this kind of philosophical contemplation. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it makes all of that easier. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's not, it, that's not an end in itself. You do that, you kind of gain those skills in an environment where um, that's what's kind of promoted by the space. And then, then you can kind of go back like Socrates, to, Socrates is always doing, you know, going back into town. Like, I love this image of like going out to the academy, coming back into town, you know, that's, mm. that's kind of, I think the, the philosopher needs to somehow make his way back to town. Right, right. So epoche is not an end in itself. It is a precondition of something that is important. Yeah, that's my view. And of course, like the skeptics are, you know, we get our word skepticism from this philosophical attitude where epoche is sort of never suspended. Mm. or uh never um never released uh you, so like it's skepticism about knowledge skepticism about being you're kind of always um uh Sloterdijk talks about being in a state of suspended animation mm -hmm. you're just suspending judgment but with withholding any kind of certain view of of the state of things um and my my view would be a little bit different which is that you you're kind of cycling in and out of states of something like epoche and then making, then committing yourself to certain kinds of claims. Mm -hmm. um, it's very nice. That's yeah. a very nice description of uh, epoche and its goal. The first, uh, at first when you described it, I, I thought about, because you were describing it as a relation between an observer and a, a, a person and appearances, how things are. Mm -hmm. And it would be, uh, when we unburden the appearances from our interpretation of them, where we, mm. we just we approach, uh, when we make that move, we yeah. approach things as they are, as they are presented, the way they are, they are, they are present, yeah. and not reading too much into them. And then the, another sense of being unburdened has to do with the person himself or herself, which is to, to be able to do that, we have to have some level of leisure some level of being unburdened from urgency or from uh, just brute demands of life. Mm -hmm. So the two senses of being unburdened to, to unburden the world from our own interpretations. Yeah. Yeah. And in that sense, you, you, the, the sense that you start to get is that there's, there's a real, uh, there's, there's, there's one way in which you can kind of see or construct experiences having a, a very definite kind of inside outside quality, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a, I think that's actually a result of living in a certain kind of way. And I think that there are certain kinds of um, forms of life say that perhaps we modern humans are, are kind of deeply on one side of that encourages this sharp 
sort of division between inside and outside. Mm -hmm. But um, these one of the effects of these practices are to kind of, um, I don't know if flattening is the right word, but to show you that these kinds of moves in epoche, like a, a suspension of, of judgment or attachment to external exper uh, appearances, um, actually is kind of the same, the same process of, of um, suspending, suspending judgment or relation to your thoughts, feelings, physiological states, things that we think of as like being inside mm -hmm. of us. Um, but from a certain perspective, there just is stuff happening and that stuff crosses the inside outside boundary. And I think you, just to kind of go back to this question of like, is this self development or self overcoming? I think in the direction of self overcoming or um, self, you know, these sort of practices of death to, to, to self or your sense of identity, those inside outside boundaries start to break down. Mm -hmm. And is it, uh, is part of being strange, being a strange person uh, as a philosopher, uh, does that partly have to do with this understanding that realizing that the suspension is possible and then you can recommit uh, subsequently? Yeah, I think so. I, I think, I think so. Mm. Great. Any, any, uh, any other note about the other chapters of Ado's book, Ancient Philosophy? No, I'm, I'm just, I, you know, I'm kind of a, a just a, a, a salesman for this book. Mm. <laughs> I think, uh, I, I think it, it um, the history is very good, you know, just as a, a scholarly reconstruction of, um, like I said, uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and then Stoicism. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you get some nice transitions from um, Hellenism, Hellenistic Greece to Roman imperial um, f philosophy and what are the transitions that happen there into Neoplatonism, into the way these, these um, philosophical ideas and practices get translated and absorbed into Christianity and then on mm -hmm. into modernity and... Um, uh, up into the present, really. It's, I mean, fantastic reconstruction, very well written. Mm. Um, but also one of those things that, um, yeah, it, it, it changes how you read other philosophical texts. Mm. So like a, a whole other sort of uh, world of possibilities opened up once I kind of, once Hado's message kind of went through, it, it kind of modulated my reading of every other philosophy book and every other, you know, philosophical insight and practice mm -hmm. that I've uh, encountered since. So I think uh, this is good for, uh, you know, people who study philosophy as, you know, either as a vocation or for school or whatever, but it's also good for, um, you know, anybody who wants to get in on, well, what is, what is philosophy, you know, really quote unquote, like what, Fine. um, I think this is the place, the good place mm -hmm. to start. Mm -hmm. Especially getting rid of some of the negative uh, reputations of philosophy. Yeah. As detached or as useless. It might be useless, but not in the way that people uh, generally might think. Yeah, and I think that's, um, Hado, Hado definitely picks this up in this book and in other essays. Um, mm -hmm. He has a lot to say about uh sort of the state of philosophy, what's happened to philosophy. And I, so I think if you're, if you're a person who has those criticisms about philosophy, I think you'll find that Hado shares in those criticisms and has um, interesting things to say in response to them. <laughs> I would also say it is a, a very readable, enjoyable uh, book in so far, so far uh, in my experience. And it is not, a dismissive critic, uh, criticism in any way. It is actually, it is, you said that you are a salesperson for this book and the book itself is also uh, acting like a salesperson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're uh, yeah. doing like a meta sales. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Martin Laird's book. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them, anyways. The one that I read a little bit from is The a Sunlit Absence. 
and I see its connection to both uh, Noe's book and Ado's uh, views of practical philosophy. And for example, the, one of the themes that was very salient in, uh, in th this one, Laird's book, was uh, the theme of silence. Mm -hmm. And something that really stuck uh, in my mind was his statement that silence doesn't have an opposite, that the opposite of silence is not sound or mm -hmm. noise or chatter, that silence is something we can find uh, even in, uh, in the middle of noise or in the middle of a conversation or uh, even among chatter, there is mm -hmm. still silence there and to be, to be viewed, to be, to be in touch with. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, to see that, to see that silence, to, to hear it, to be with it, and yeah. that requires practice and uh, cultivation mm -hmm. of attention and perception. Yeah. So yeah, that was one of the things I, that uh, got my attention from that book. Yeah, that has, you know, it's funny because there's something, there's something about, uh, there's something about humans, there's something about us as people that um, we have, we have this ongoing need to fill in the silence or to fill in space with sure. things, distractions, activities, sometimes even with, you know, healthy, you know, practices and activities, but um, emptiness and silence are, are things that I don't, I, I suspect it's probably like a, 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 a sort of a global human thing, but we might be especially bad at it nowadays yes, with yes. our very stimulated, very kind of always on hyper interconnected um, spaces. But uh, one, one of the things that I've, I've tried to give an account of for other people, for other people talking so much about practice and talking so much about uh, the relationship between practice and perception and action um, is, is what are, what are my practices? Right. Um, and the, the best one I have uh, Martin Laird has given me a lot of language for talking about, and that's silence. And um, everything you say about it from that point uh, is kind of, besides the point, you know, the point is, is the silence. Mm -hmm. um, we can say other things about it. And uh, one of the things that I love about Laird and that that's also been true. One of the things that I think um, all of these books has in common is that they, they say things that you can almost immediately go and investigate for yourself in your own experience. And so there's, there's a kind of, um, sometimes people use the phrase inner empiricism, mm. which, which I take to be a kind of a phenomenology of the, the, the inner landscape, the inner world. Um, and when you turn your attention onto it, it's, it's like anything else. Like at first you notice a few gross details and then the more you pay attention, the more details start to come out and you start to see subtleties and um, nuances and, and, and things like that, like, you know, if you're walking through a landscape, for example, the first time you kind of maybe just see inarticulate shrubs and bushes and uh, you don't know what anything is. And, but the more time you spend there, the more, the more you can kind of see the differences between, you know, the, the leaves and different kinds of plant growth. And you start to be able to identify, oh, there's this plant, there's that plant, like things start to become more vivid. And, um, what, what Laird does and what I think I wasn't really, what he helped me give some language to is, is that um, silence is something like that too. We think of silence as one thing, um, but it's it, like there's details mm. if, if you want to talk about it that way in the silence. And so it's almost like the silence becomes more expressive it sounds a little paradoxical, but it does become more expressive the more you just uh, engage it and give your attention to silence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And would you say that silence has something to do with epoche? That that suspension uh, move is uh, somehow getting to a silent place where we can now be more aware of what is going on? Mm-hmm. 
I have to think about that. I haven't, I haven't posed those two concepts right next to each other. My intuitive sense, and maybe I'll change my mind about this when I think about it a little bit more, but my, my, my intuitive sense is that ep epoche feels more active and assertive, even if it's a kind of suspended activity. Mm -hmm. Whereas this, this kind of silent contemplative practices feel more passive. Mm. It feels more like just sinking in, letting go, mm. um, which to me has a different feeling to it. And I do think that these are these are actual moves that you're somehow initiating in your conscious experience. So they, I think they do have qualities that we can talk about, and you know, other people can agree and disagree about whether or not this is the best way to characterize them. Right. 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 But so that's that's the feeling that I have is that this feels more this feels more passive and you know with Laird um, and other other people uh, there's another there's another good uh, great um, Middle English text uh, called the Cloud of Unknowing that also mm -hmm. kind of deals with with silence in a way but it also talks about a, a kind of a senseless reasonless darkness. And the, you're kind of you're kind of moving into this space, or or letting this thing that's always kind of, as you say, it's always there in the background, um, but just kind of bringing it into the foreground. And um, it's the the that kind of darkness isn't. It's not like a dark night of the soul kind of thing. It's a. It's more like a. It's more like just like this place where your reasons and concepts and senses kind of don't have anything to grasp onto. So maybe that's the difference between epoche. Epoche is kind of done in these spaces where reasons and concepts and, and senses have some kind of purchase. And here what's happening is that they just, they, they simply are in a space where they all just kind of fail. Mm. And it, like you kind of go through this process of just like letting them fail. Like this is kind of like rumination you know, and then after a while, the rumination kind of gives way to something else. It gives way to something like silence. Um, but then the silence has this kind of like weird, um, Laird will often talk about like the living presence. And you, that's, you know, in my, in my life, something very real, you know, the, the silence becomes a kind of a living presence. And then the silence opens out into what? Uh, even more silence. Like, you know, there's... Um, like layers of depth. Like a, layers of depth. Like yeah. Or I was, you know, I was thinking um, of just because we've been um, in, this, in this pandemic and everything's been closed down here in California. I've been doing a lot more hiking mm. just, just to get away from everything because there's, there's not a lot you can do. Um, in the normal spaces and, you know, hiking, hiking was something that I would do normally, but um, this, the situation has just kind of uh, led me to kind of, you know, go out further than I normally would, you know, and, you know, you go out, you, the, people have this experience, right? Where you, you get to the parking lot, you find the trailhead, you walk mm -hmm. out onto the trail and like you're in nature, sort of, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's nature, but it's this kind of curated space and, you have this kind of like first loop on the trail and there's lots of other people on that part of the trail and the trail's very wide and it's, it's, it, it's, it's made for it to be very easy for you to just kind of casually stroll through. And then you go a little bit further and something happens, you know, the trail gets a little bit less kept. It gets a little narrower that like, the natural world is kind of coming in on you a little bit more, you know, you're further out, you haven't seen anybody for a while now hmm. and the space gets bigger and then you keep going a little bit further and the space gets bigger and then you cross another kind of line and you're, you're kind of like all of a sudden you're like, Oh wait, do I, I should probably figure out where I am because now I'm pretty far out and now like those kind of, those kinds of normal signposts are disappearing mm. and the terrain is looking a little bit wilder and 
you're kind of like, oh, I'm more responsible for myself out here than I am over there, you know, because I've been at this for, you know, a couple hours now. And so I think when, when Laird's talking about silence, it's this kind of thing where it's like there's silence and then there's a bigger silence mm -hmm. and then there's a, a bigger, vaster silence. And so you get this kind of weird, um, yeah, there's like a taxonomy of, of silent spaces or something. You know, right, you can, right. it's qualitatively different. Um, and then something like that happens and what's, what's the practice? Stay with the silence. You know, don't, don't get too, um, don't get too caught up in the new scene. You know, mm -hmm. the new scene can be very interesting and like, oh, what's happening now? Uh, but that will pull you out of it. So, you, you know, you just try and stay with it. Mm. Yeah, so uh, something that some psychologists have talked about is uh, what something that makes people anxious is unstructured time. It's actually when, if somebody says, let's have a minute of silence collectively, and that is not going to provoke any anxiety. But if it is unstructured silence, then that is more uncomfortable. Uh, for right. people because it is, it is not a designated time, just like how you were describing the path, the, the trail. Uh, initially, it was a designated path for people to walk. It was already a decision made in advance yeah. to have that path there. It was designated. But then you entered into a, a non-designated area, which is yeah. now you are there. You, you decide to be there more so than before. Um, right. You make it the designated path maybe yeah and that's that's very much what laird says you know the, the into the silent land mm. um the silent land is you or it's your it's the bigger you the the depths that you have and mm. that you actually are traversing some kind of a territory mm. you know which is interesting just if if you want to think about socrates in this context and a topos that word a topos, topos comes from like topography, mm. like the shape of the landscape. And a topos is kind of like shapeless or without, without the form of the landscape. Um, and so that's kind of the, the thing that's happening is there's the, the familiar landscape is kind of dissolving into something, mm. um, something bigger. It's, it's strange. But also familiar. So I I, I hold those things together uh, closely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have this experience. I, I allow myself to have this experience with reading uh, more and more recently, which is uh, sometimes I begin reading something with a sense of rush that I need to finish reading this in a, in an hour, and mm -hmm. then I I realize I can't I can't do it justice. So I slow down, and when I slow down, I'm I get more anxious like oh now I, I can't even do it in twice the time but then I continue to slow down and slow down slow down until I'm just reading a sentence or a few words mm -hmm. and then I get in touch with that feeling of peace mm -hmm. that this is all fine it's like this is just extremely I don't know what the word is but it, it is extremely okay I mean this is good to be uh, to be reading a few words and and nothing uh, nothing else because these this experience suddenly becomes so rich or maybe I become aware of its of the richness that is present that was present even before when I was in a rush, mm -hmm. and it just completely transforms the, any experience, uh, including reading. For me, it is more common in, uh, to happen in reading, but I can imagine it happening in walking, uh, during a conversation, uh, just sitting in silence. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and, yeah. That's, I mean, that's the thing you hear again and again is that the, the things that you go out and find in a contemplative space or, you know, cultivating that kind of silence. Um, it's, it's not that you're, you're generating some novel thing. It's that mm -hmm. you're attuning yourself to something that's always there. And you can you can find that you can refine that or remember, you know. I think of it in terms of the language of like remembering and forgetting mm. that 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 state that you're describing when you're reading is is always 
available, you know, always available to you, but we forget because we think, uh, we think that the goal is so important or we, we think that, um, and a lot of the times, you know, it is you're, you're, you're put into a situation where you have to get something done for, for somebody else or for your job or for whatever. Um, and it, we forget, we, we forget immediately, you know, forget a million times a day mm-hmm. that there's this, this background that's, that's right there all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's, I want to bring up something else uh, that is a little bit, maybe could be perceived as a skepticism but it is a genuine curiosity. And I'm, I'm going to anchor it to uh, something very concrete and use it as a metaphor. And that is uh, Laird in one of the chapters talks about sitting, the, just the mechanics of sitting to pray or sitting to meditate. Mm-hmm. And he says, uh, you can sit on the ground uh, or on a chair. And, and many people uh, say that it's best to sit on a, uh, what is it called? A prayer seat. It's like a cushion. Mm-hmm. that lifts you up a little bit, maybe not about, about nine inches above the ground. And uh, I actually have experienced this and it is more comfortable, much more comfortable and feels more natural to sit on something uh, a li- slightly above the ground. Mm-hmm. But to me, that suggests that the human body is not completely prepared. I mean, we are not, uh, it's just a sim. it's like a, becomes a metaphor for me, becomes like a suggestion that, oh, maybe the human body, what we are, the default state, it is not completely made for this. It is not made to appreciate silence. It's, that is, it, there's a bit of an artificiality to this, to these practices. So what do you think about that? I think, um, I think these practices... One of, one of the reasons that I'm attracted to these three books and these, you know, three different kinds of ways of relating to these questions is because mm-hmm. they, they have a few things in common. Um, attention to perception is one thing that we already talked about, but they all also involve the body to mm-hmm. a, a great degree. Mm-hmm. And um, to me, I think there's, you know, so in Hado, for example, there's, there's a lot of attention paid to athletic metaphors. This is like contemplative exercises can be thought of as kind of athletic exercises of the mind or of consciousness or, you know, however you want to think about it. Um, and I think that that athletic metaphor is really apt just because of exactly what you're talking about. Like mm-hmm. you actually need to train your body to do some of these things. And so um, training in a physical sense is, is uh, to me at least, and I think to a lot of people, makes the principles of practice really obvious because you're looking at these kind of gross behavioral changes. You know, so I think about, um, you know, martial arts, for example, has been a big part of my life. Um, mm. you, you can teach somebody how to throw a jab and a cross and a hook um, and, the body can do those things, but the, the level of precision and efficacy that you're looking for in it at the level of like sporting competition, say, is just, isn't something that people just have, you know, they have to, they have to practice it and they have to, you actually have to change your body. Mm-hmm. You know, your body is not the same. It actually has to go through, physiological reorganization right. in the direction of that practice. And I think what you're describing is, is something like the same thing. It's, it's a thing that we can do, but we, we actually have to train our bodies in that direction. Mm-hmm. And, you know? and I, I hear a, a sense of finding, like there's a search in it also involved. Like we find the, the posi- mm-hmm. right positions or we find the right practices. Yeah. That suits us or suits. Yeah. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That (laughs) that, that resolves the the question actually. Yeah. I I think it's, I think it's something like that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. Um, All right. Anything else about uh, any of the books or the three books? I, 
needless to say, based on what I've read so far, I would join you in recommending the books. Um, nice. For, but I, I still haven't uh, reached that level of seeing the, all the connections between them. Um, I spend a lot of time with uh, Noe's book. Mm -hmm. I, re I read, uh, read it once alone, and I read it with a group of um, small group of philosophy students, researchers in philosophy, and yeah, then yeah. they criticized it a lot. They said, "Oh, this is all these ideas. You can read it in somewhere else. You can read, find it in Heidegger, or like or Gadamer." Yeah. And mm -hmm. but I still, you know, after some time passed, I still appreciate Noe's style of. Yeah, I think so. I well, I I I would agree with that, and I think I think um, Wittgenstein is is the other person that right, comes to right. mind in that conversation. Mm -hmm. But I I think the um, the barrier to entry with with Noe is is much lower. Absolutely. Um, than like you know getting somebody to read Heidegger, and that's a huge advantage. It's, it's a, a huge it's advantage. A, it counts as a merit on his part. He's yeah, managed to do that. I think so. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I guess the uh, the last thing that we haven't really talked about that he that he gets into that I really appreciate is that he he has all of these really nice sort of I find very parsimonious and simple resolutions to the to the relationship between like concepts and perception mm. or or thinking and sensing, mm -hmm. and we have inherited either explicitly or implicitly some fairly dualistic accounts of right. these things. Um, and I talk to even people who um, are, in, are involved in like meditative practice who, in, in my opinion, can sometimes inherit this dualistic language where they kind of have the concept and discourse discursive level running on like one line and sensations and emotions and perceptions on another line. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're really paying attention, you can see how entangled those two levels really are and that they're not actually distinct levels. It's only after the fact in language that we talk about them that way. And yeah. Noe, I think, has some really... Well, so, so then what do you do if, if there is just kind of more of an integrated field of activity? How, what, what do we do with concept talk? What do we do with perception talk? Um, and I think he has some really nice... Um, solutions to that just in terms of like talking about concepts as kind of skills right they're kind right. of like skilled Inter. engagements yeah right yeah right. Mm -hmm. ways of ways of grasping things um so yeah that's i mean and that i think um i really find uh highly connected to the way the, the way hado talks about knowledge for example mm -hmm. um so yeah i see Great. But, yeah, they all come together. Mm -hmm. All right, Adam Robert, thank you very much for this conversation. Hey, thanks so much. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, for me too. Let me yeah, stop the recording and then um, we will talk a bit more.